after uh, hearing Peter share, David and I were like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just repeat everything he just said. <laughs> that was awesome. My name is Zane Black, and uh, I went to Timberline Lodge uh, Bible School um, just over 20 years ago now, which is awesome. And um, <clears throat> I had to confess this to Peter, the international director, I think, uh, last year, is that the way that I paid for my Bible school tuition, um, I kind of lived a wild life before I came to know Jesus, um, and I mean, kicked out of my house, uh, a lot of just drug abuse and selling to pay for my own habits, and um, and then I came to know Jesus. Someone told me about Bible school, and I sold a car that I had bought with drug money, and that's how I paid for my Bible school tuition, <laughs> you know. And now I'm a Torchbearers representative, and I get to invite students to come to Torchbearers, and some students, we don't have enough money. I'm like, I got a plan. No, just joking. <laughs> I do not do that, but uh, whatever it takes. Um, and it was there at Timberline that my life was radically changed. I was not raised in a Christian home, um, and so, uh, and I was not very studious. So I actually, uh, when I heard about torchbearers, I. I wasn't really sure about the whole Bible school part of it, but someone told me there was a center that you could snowboard at. And I was like, I sense the voice of the Lord. And uh, so I Googled, you know, Torchbearer, and, and, and there was, it was in Colorado. Well, there's actually two in Colorado, and one was called Ravencrest Chalet, which was a picture of it in the mountains and snow all around, and the other one was uh, Timberline Lodge, which looked, it was more of a summer shot, and I thought, oh man, well, which one is the one that you can snowboard behind? And so I just did eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Again, the level of my spiritual journey at that point was a first step, and so I mowed or meeny, I don't know how that ends, but I landed on Timberline Lodge, and so I said, okay, I'll go. I went into Budweiser, which is where I was working on the side. I put in my two-week notice. They're like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to Bible school after they, like, you know, passed out and came back. <laughs> they were like, for what? I was like, I'm going to learn about Jesus. And um, so I, I showed up at Bible school, and it was all so new to me. And so any time that a teacher taught, I would take notes as like, this is 100% truth. This is like everything they say. But then as some teachers continued to teach, I realized that some of them had different perspectives of some of the minor points of theology. And I was like, wait, wait, you guys don't all like perfectly agree on every single point? And they were like, no, because they were about the main thing. And there was these little differences. And so then this began to like, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you'd say like, not set me through a tailspin, but then I was like really interested to like learn more. And I began to study myself and not just take something that someone else said, but I wanted to like search it out. And so if you will, I want you to like kind of go with me, <laughs> with Zane to 20 years ago at Timberline, learning some of these things for the first time. And, um, and so I'm gonna ask for some like uh, participation here, and I'm gonna ask some questions, and then you can respond, yes, hand up, no, keep your hand down, okay? So this is part of my journey, and you're kinda coming with me, all right? Um, is Jesus God? Yes. Okay, okay, awesome. If you did not put your hand up, God just took away your birthday. No. <laughs> uh, yes, okay, Jesus is 
God, right? These were some of the basics. Um, he forgave sins. Jesus accepted worship. He uh, called himself Lord uh, and said he was the only way to eternal life. We see in John 1, uh, verse 1, he is in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, right? As we have seen his glory, the glory of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, next question. Can God die? No, right? God can't die. It's a movie, right? Check it out. God's not dead. Um, Okay, next question. Did Jesus die? Yeah, right? I hope so. (laughs) It's kind of what we're basing this whole thing off of, right? Uh, Yes, crucified on the cross. After being brutally beaten, Roman soldiers made sure he was dead, piercing his side, buried for three days. But I thought God couldn't die. And Jesus is God, and Jesus died. For me, tension began to set in. Let's keep going a little bit. Can God be tempted? This one's maybe a little trick here. Can God be tempted? Check out James 1.13. God cannot be tempted by evil. Was Jesus tempted? Yeah. At first we were all like, yeah. That was a little bit like, that's where I was. Yes, Jesus was really tempted. Hebrews 14, 4, 15. Jesus was tempted in every way as we are and yet did not sin. But I thought God can't be tempted. Some of this is difficult And we are going to walk through one of the deep and what I believe to be foundational truths for us as Christians. And next to me placing my faith and trust in Jesus, receiving him as salvation, this has been the most important truth I've learned in my life. And that is the reality of what it means that Jesus, 100% God and 100% man, and that while he lived on earth, he lived as man as man was intended to be. So now I'm going to ask that you would pray again <laughs> as I sense the tension and the hope that he'll allow me to communicate it clearly and my hope and confidence is that God can speak through a donkey. He did it in the Old Testament. I'm praying he could do it again, all right? (laughs) So, Father God, we thank you so much for the reality of your truth expressed through your word. And, Lord, would you uh, reveal to us more of who you are here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus came, yes, as 100% God, And yet also, he became man, 100%. 
This is a truth theologically that we call the incarnation. I love how uh, gotquestions.org defines the incarnation. It says the incarnation is a term used by theologians to indicate that Jesus, the Son of God, took on human flesh. The word incarnation means the act of being made flesh. That Jesus, while still being fully God and never ceasing to be God, became man, fully man. And he was made man to fully relate with us, to ultimately live with us, to die for us, to raise to new life for us, ultimately, to save us. And the reason why this is important, Colossians 2.9, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. And yet also, he was made like us. He was born into this world like us, and we begin to see pictures and parts of his humanity. Jesus got tired, John 4, 6. He got thirsty, John 19, 28. He got hungry, Matthew 4, 2, one of my favorite verses in the Bible where it says, Jesus fasted for 40 days, and he was hungry. You're like, all right, thank you uh, for that description. He experienced the things that we do. It's important so that we know that he can relate with us because he became like us. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says this. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So he was tempted like we are, yet he was without sin. My wife and I were talking recently, and Rach made a comment just about, it's just been, you know, we got three young kids, I travel, and sometimes life is hard, and Rach goes, you know what? I figured out how Jesus remained sinless. And I was like, oh, yeah? She was like, because he didn't get married and he didn't have kids. (laughs) I was like, I don't know if that's quite the case. And so the interesting idea there is like, well, was he truly made like us because he wasn't married, he didn't have kids, or he he didn't experience the temptation of social media or binge watching Netflix? It's not that he was made like us in that he experienced every specific temptation or struggle or hardship that we do. But he was made like us, and he was tempted in every way like us because he became human like us. And that although he was and is God and had the ability at any point when he was on earth to exercise his divinity, he chose to live out of his humanity. So it's like he always possessed his God card And at any point when he faced temptation, when he was fasting for 40 days, when he was hungry, when he was thirsty, when he was facing whatever difficulty, he could have said, oh man, God card, I got this. Had he exercised his divinity while here on earth, then he could not and would not have been able to relate with us in our humanity. Because then, he would have had something that we don't. 
And Hebrews says, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but we have one who was tempted in every way as we are, yet just as we are, yet he was without sin. And had Christ, when he was on earth and faced these things, just to play that God card, well, then you and I could not relate to him, could we? Because he would have had something that we do not. And the tension here for me actually grew within me an opportunity. The reality is that Jesus, when he lived as man on earth, he showed us what it is to truly be human. So now as I read through the Gospels and I understand the life of Jesus, I see him not as a God who's far off and a life that is totally unattainable as Jesus living as God on earth, but Jesus living as man on earth as a display of what it is to truly be human. Okay, another question. This is more just kind of internal. How many miracles is it recorded that Jesus did of himself on earth? If you were to kind of go through your mind and think about how many miracles it is that Jesus re- did on his own recorded through the scriptures. What's the answer? Zero. Zero? Aren't you a pastor? <laughs> Check this out. Acts 2, 22. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. That Jesus, in calming the seas, raising the dead, water to wine, healing the blind, giving uh, ability to those who, who, who had lost ability, uh, casting out demons, healing the sick, did that not as divinity, but as humanity. Not as a life that is unattainable, but as a life That is an example of a man totally surrendered and available to God. That Jesus lived on earth as man, as man was meant to be. While at any time could have flexed his God card could have lived out of his divinity, had access to all the resources of heaven, to live in that, never ceasing to be God, but living as man. John 5, 19 says this, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. Uh, Another verse in Hebrews, similar to the Hebrews 4 verse, but Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says this, for this reason he, Jesus, uh, Hebrews 2, 17 and 18, had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. According to the author of Hebrews, 
it was necessary for Jesus to be made like us in every way. Otherwise, he was not the merciful and faithful high priest. And that even Hebrews author relates it to the sufficiency of our atonement back to the humanity of Jesus on earth. And what this shows to me is that all that Jesus did on earth was an example of what man, when I say man, human, humankind, was created to be in the image of God, a display of the character and the competency of God here on earth. And this is why Jesus says in John 14, verse 12, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I love how he says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing. He'll actually do even greater works than I because I go to the Father. Jesus says, you'll do what I do. I love what uh, Peter kind of alluded to this reality of how many people would say, man, I wish that I could go back to to when Jesus was alive because if I could just be with him, If I could have like walked with him like the disciples would, that would change everything for me. If I could just talk with him, if I could just be around him for like a a little bit. I mean, the disciples, they got three years with him. Like if I could just go there, like I I feel like it would fix so many of my questions that I have or help me in so many of the struggles that I have. Yet Jesus says in John 16, 7, it is good for you that I go away. It is good for you that I go away and that you'll do greater things than I. Okay, can I pause there for a second? (laughs) Greater things than Jesus. He calmed the storms. He healed the blind. He raised the dead. What's left Greater things than Jesus. <laughs> Again, for me came tension. What? But it's good for you that I go away. Why is it good that he goes away? Because he would send his spirit who would live within us. So not only the disciples, yes, they had it good because they could be with Jesus, as Peter talked about, but we, as disciples today, get to have Jesus in us through the power of his spirit, that we have no lack. And so what's greater is that we, when we have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. We do it post-resurrection and post-Pentecost. We don't talk about one day the Spirit who will come. We share of the Spirit who has come. We share not only looking towards the cross, but from the cross and the result of the resurrection. And we have the opportunity to lead people, not just to be raised from the physical death, but to experience the reality of spiritual life. 
that when we go as representatives of Jesus here on earth, image bearers displaying him, we not only get to share about the death of Christ and them being freed and forgiven of their sin, but also the ex- receiving of Christ and the empowerment to truly live. Maybe this um, kind of gives a, a little bit of, of a picture uh, of the potential, I think, that lays before us. When we truly understand, as Peter was talking about, the reality of the one who not only gave his life for us, but who gives his life to us, the power that it is to live the new life. So I recently um, started surfing, okay? And it turns out you can actually surf in Minnesota. And I know that for like somebody like right now, you look outside and it doesn't exactly seem like the beaches of California, right? <laughs> but um, I just, and, and you're kind of like, wait, where can you surf in Minnesota? Turns out on Lake Superior, there, if at certain times of season, it can, it gets so much wind that it can create surfable waves here in Minnesota. Some of you are still looking at me like there's no way. I have a picture of a wave on Lake Superior. This is not a picture that has been edited. This is not a Photoshop. This is not taken from California. This is 25 minutes north of Duluth. It takes winds that are sustained, not that you can see, (laughs) that are 20 miles an hour or more for 12 hours or more, and it produces surfable waves on a lake. Now, the reality of surfing in Minnesota, though, again, because as you look outside, it's not exactly the beachfront that you would imagine, there are some um, difficulties that you must endure. I think the next picture is of me in my wetsuit, and you could see, surrounded by snow, that day it was four degrees. Translation, that's still 28 degrees below freezing. You can't quite tell in the picture, but my hood is frozen. Like, you have to be willing to brave the elements. The badge of honor for lake surfers is the next picture, which is called the ice beard. (laughs) This day, it was negative 10. 42 degrees below freezing. You're like, surf's up. (laughs) Okay. Again, some people are still like, wait, like, do really, like, do waves get that big on the lake? Here's a picture of a 50-foot cliff up north and a wave this two years ago crashing over a 50-foot cliff in our backyard, Lake Superior. Okay, awesome, Chris, thank you. Now, what they say, actually, would you leave that one up there maybe for a little bit in this next part? Thanks, Chris. Um, A deep water ocean wave can travel up to 30 miles an hour. They say that one cubic foot of water weighs 62 and a half pounds. The force of a wave is almost unimaginable. Big wave surfers, they train to hold their breath for three minutes or more because the power and the force of a wave, if it crashes on you, can hold you underwater that long. The first time I ever surfed was not in Minnesota. It was in California. Oh, no, sorry, it was in Hawaii. And uh, so it was warm water, felt a little bit more inviting. And I remember struggling so 
hard to try and catch a wave. Has anybody here ever surfed before? Okay, awesome. So some of you got some of you know, I would say one of the most difficult parts of surfing is just catching the wave. And you paddle and you battle and you struggle. And I felt like I was just wore out. And I'm like, how in the world do you catch this? You know, I grew up snowboarding. I'm like, I can snowboard, but I don't have to catch the mountain. <laughs> you just ride a chairlift up, right? And go down, let gravity do the work. And I was so frustrated. And then came this local Hawaiian surfer, looked like he was just so skinny, looked like he lived off of mangoes and pineapple, right? And he was like, it's easy, bro, just catch the wave. And he was just on loop, catching wave after wave after wave. And then finally I was like, help me, like, what do you do? And I'll never forget, he was like, we got to know each other, he was like, Zane, here's the deal. I've seen some of, I've seen bodybuilders out here, guys with muscles in places I don't even have places, And they're the ones who are first wore out. And I was like, why? And he's like, because they try too hard. And I was like, well, what's the secret? He was like, Zane, stop fighting it. Let the wave do the work. I'm like, how do you do that? And he said, it's all about being in the right position. He said, follow me. So I kind of paddled over, and he's like, here's where you want to sit. Next thing I knew, here came this wave, and it's rolling to me. And I look, and he's like, wait, 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 wait. Go. And I took one paddle, two paddle, and the wave picked me up. And I could feel the rush of the ocean, the power of this force of nature propel me. I stood up on my board, and off I went my first time surfing. And it started as I was in the right position and allowing the power of the wave to do the work. And I think this, for me, has been the key of beginning to understand the life of Christ. I can try so hard to live a life pleasing to God, working to to do it for Jesus. But I've found it's often more about my position, the position of my heart, the position of faith. In the same way that I believe that Jesus lived on my behalf and died on my behalf and rose to new life, and so I believe that one day I will be with him forever in heaven. That has become my key to now living his life on earth. And the same way that I have total confidence that one day I will be with Jesus forever in heaven, I, by faith, position myself to say, I believe that he will also live his life on earth. By faith, is how I am learning to position myself to allow His power to propel me forward. And so, when I sit there and I listen to Peter preach, and I'm like, man, what am I going to say after that? I've got nothing. I feel like the Father says, finally, (laughs) good. You've got nothing. This is a great position to start. And so then I say, okay, God, I believe that when I walk up on stage in the same way that I believe you lived for me, you died for me, and you rose for me, I believe now you'll live through me. And I look, go check in the mirror, I'm like, huh, kind of look the same, but uh, (laughs) I'm trusting that it's not what's on the outside, but it's what's on the inside. And so I walk up here, And by faith, I believe that it will be his power that will propel me forward. And like Jesus, in my humanity, I surrender to the Father and say, Lord, have your way within me. 
and then I walk, and then I walk. This verse is not on the screen, but it made me just think of Ephesians 2.10, where it says, God has prepared us for good works in advance that we might walk in them. I'll never forget the first time I had the opportunity to begin to preach. Um, I, I had been at Timberline for, I think, uh, two years. At that time, Timberline was just a three-month Bible school, and so you could go for three months, and then it was done. Well, apparently I was a slow learner because I stayed there for 10 years. Um, but uh, I was a couple years in, and there was this ministry that traveled around and trained teenagers to share their faith with their friends. And so they would hold these big conferences. Um, at the time, they booked out the Pepsi Center in Denver. So there was going to be 9,000 kids there. And they asked me to come share. And I was so scared. And I'm not talking like, oh, little, I was petrified. I, I wrote prayer letters back home. Friends didn't even know Jesus, ex-drug pray for, do whatever, just say something for me. <laughs> I was so nervous. And on my prayer sheet was like, you know, there was a couple spiritual things, you know, uh, pray that I would abide in Christ and his words abide with me and he would do the work. And then my last one pray, was pray that I don't poop my pants on stage. Okay. I'm just being real. Like I was, that's, I was just so nervous. I had literally brought depends diapers. Uh, and it was a reminder to me to depend on the Lord. I was so nervous. And my roommate, uh, went down. Um, he was, a uh, one of the other preachers was this former NFL football player. This dude was huge, right? And I mean, he would be backstage doing push-ups, getting ready to preach, and, uh, and then there was me, like, rocking in the corner in the fetal <laughs> position. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I was like, Derwin, like, how are you feeling, man? And he looked at me, and he would always say this, Zane, it doesn't matter how I feel, because God has prepared me for good works in advance that I might walk in them. All I got to do is walk, man. And, and, and I think that gives a, a, a little picture of what it is to walk by faith. Not only to believe by faith that we are saved and our destination is heaven, but by faith to believe that our destiny on earth is living in the glory of God now, by faith. It's cool that Guy Derwin, I remember asking, like, man, like, what was one of the most impactful books that you've ever read? And he said, it's this little book, it's by this guy named Major Ian Thomas. And Derwin became another voice in my life about the reality of the fullness of God that's available to each and every one of us. That we, like Jesus, live submitted to the Father by faith, positioning ourselves for His power to propel us forward. That He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Second Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. 2 Peter 1, 3, that we've been given everything we need, everything we need for life and for godliness. And I have maybe one last illustration. Ben, and I'm totally putting you on the spot. Can I use your guitar? Oh, okay. Um, I'll... I'll be careful, although it looks like you're not careful with it. This thing has seen, it, seen better days. I love it. So my father-in-law is a luthier. Do you know what a luthier is? Some people know very well. Um, a luthier is a maker of stringed instruments. My father-in-law lives here in Minnesota. He was trained by a guy named Jim Olson. You guys, maybe some of you have heard of Jim Olson, Olson Guitars. I think he sell, Olson sells his guitars for 20000 a piece. 
Yeah, James Taylor plays an, a, a, a Jim Olsen uh, guitar. A two-year waiting list. So my father-in-law, who lives here in Minnesota, as does Jim Olson, decided to reach out, said, hey, I'd love to make guitars. Jim Olson took him under his wing as like a disciple. My father-in-law now makes guitars. And what he does is wild. He had this idea that he would begin to experiment with different woods. So he'll fly to like Alaska, and he finds leftover lumber from logging companies. Takes the logs, cuts them up, it looks like firewood, big old pieces. Wraps rope around them, that's like a suitcase. Brings it on the plane. Back to Minnesota. Starts with a chainsaw, which you're like, this doesn't look like the beginnings of a fine-tuned instrument. He takes the chainsaw, and he uses what's called an Alaskan sawmill, and he like cuts the log in half. Then he takes it into his basement, and he begins through the series of many different tools and many different processes to cut the wood up to become an instrument. And then it makes me think about the reality of what God does in our life. We, like those logs, have become fallen lumber, left for dead. But my father-in-law, much like the father, sees the beauty in the brokenness. And like my father-in-law, takes a trip to a faraway place to rescue a fallen log. So the father sent his son Jesus on what seemed like a faraway trip to become man, to then rescue the lumber, and then begin to do work. And, and through a process, and for me, that process has been growing in what is probably known as spiritual disciplines, but can often look like trying hard for God. But I've found now that the spiritual disciplines are more for me like habits of grace, rhythms of which I present myself before God for Him to use His tools to fashion me and form me into what He is making me. And through this process of me daily, not faithfully, <laughs> presenting myself before Him, He fashions me and He forms me. And we go through this process. But then, the most beautiful part to me about my father-in-law being a maker is that he is also a musician. And I believe it is the same for our father. That not only is he the maker, but he is the musician. So not only is he the one who rescues us, who forms us, but he will be the one who will play his song through us. That he is the one who has rescued us. He will be the one who will form us. And he will be the one to play his song through us. Because not only is he the maker, he is the musician. And Jesus demonstrated that reality to the fullness of the potential. That we, as men and women, have the opportunity to present ourselves before God, 
to say, God, you fashion the instrument. I don't know whether it's going to be a guitar, whether it's going to be a mandolin, a ukulele, but I'm going to allow you then to play your song through us. And I bet probably not very many of us even looked at Ben's guitar as he was up here playing because it was actually less about the guitar and it was more about the song that he was playing through it. This is the opportunity we have as followers of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says this, the one who is faithful, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The one who's called us is faithful, and he will do it. He will do that work in and through us. He will be the one who forms us. He will be the one who works through us. And we, by faith, position ourselves to be propelled by his strength. Um, I did not talk with you guys you want. I didn't know if we were planning on singing another song Yeah, awesome, Ben. I would love it. I would love an opportunity to respond, not just uh, to me, but, uh, but to God. As we think about these truths, it's one thing to understand, like Peter said, and it's another thing to unleash. And this is what has been, for me, the greatest challenge, I think, after having been at Torchbearers, is I think I understood much about the life of Jesus because I could repeat the language about the life of Jesus. And I think over the process of the last 10 years, having moved from a Torchbearer Center to living in the real world, (laughs) has been learning not only to understand his life, but to unleash his life. To not only be able to repeat the language that Major Thomas often spoke so eloquently, but to represent that life. And I would say, if I'm honest, I'm still in process. There's some days that I do a lot better. Some days I do a lot worse. But thankfully, it's not about me. It's about him. And that opportunity that each and every one of us has to continue to position ourselves to say, okay, Lord, would you live your life through me here and now? No matter what obstacle I face is an opportunity for you to show yourself faithful. And so I surrender and I buy faith in the same way I believe where my destination is, where I will one day be. I believe by faith that he will live his life now. And we walk. So Father God, I thank you so much uh, for this uh, friends which feel often like family um, here today. Would you continue to reveal to us more and more uh, your heart for us and your life here for us. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.